few years ago, a friend of mine and I, we went to Bangalore from Bombay. Uh, we were going for a conference and when we got the boarding passes for the return flight, we saw something very interesting in that. And that was the seat numbers that we got while going and coming back were exactly the same. Uh, usually people when they see these kind of things, there is some kind of an excla exclamation that, oh wow, what a coincidence. But the math teacher in me made me come up with a question on probability. And this is what I asked the students who were attending a workshop a few weeks from then. They were a bunch of high school kids who were in grade 8, 9 and um, they were quite enthusiastic about mathematics. So I just asked them, imagine you are traveling on a plane with your friend and both of you, uh, you know, you, you book uh, tickets but you don't get to choose the seats. The airlines, they randomly allocate seats to both of you and it's a plane which has, let's say, 10 rows and 6 seats in every row. But when you sit in your seat, you see that your friend is sitting right next to you. What is the probability that such an event will happen? And everyone started working on the problem except for one boy. And he looked at me and he asked, Sir, what do you mean by probability? And I knew that I had made a big mistake by introducing a not so easy problem as the first problem to some kid who has not been exposed to probability at all. But I somehow, you know, maintained my poise, went to him and I gave the usual examples of tossing coins and rolling dice uh, and he said, okay, I think I get some sense of it and he started working towards it. So I was kind of curious to see what he is doing and how he is thinking through it. And I, I was peeping into his notebook and in the next 10 minutes, I saw the foundations of probability getting unveiled in his notebook. He had, he had solved that problem in less than 10 minutes. And that was for the first time I was seeing, you know, some student like him who was not introduced to the subject had the ability to solve it. Now these kind of students, I would like to call them as the uninitiated. Why? Because they have the innate potential, but they have not been introduced to challenging stuff that can bring out their potential. Let me bring another example. Um, about eight years ago, a bunch of students from a school, they came for a math camp that we were doing. And, you know, there were some of them who were so good at, you know, the, the camp and solving problems. I really hoped that they would come back the next year. But unfortunately, none of them turned out except for one boy, who I barely remembered was part of the previous year's camp. And he kept coming year after year. So I was kind of curious what made him come because he was not the best. He, he seemed to enjoy what he was doing, but he was, he was not able to solve all the problems. So after a few years, I just asked him, you know, what made you come for the camp again when none of your friends actually came? And he told me something very interesting. He said, I always thought I was good at math, but here I was struggling to solve all the problems. And that motivated me to come for the camp again. Now, how many times do we come across students like these who say that I failed, I made mistakes, I couldn't succeed and that's what motivated me to come for the camp. So these are the kind of students who need that kind of a platform so that they can bring out their potential. And this student right now, he is he's applying for a PhD program. He got into one of the best institutes for his undergraduate program. And if you ask me eight years ago, would I have guessed that he would land up here? Definitely not. He was very unassuming. Because most of these uninitiated students, they are not the usual class toppers. They don't know how to crack the code of the exam. And that's the next category of students that I'm going to talk about. That is the class toppers. I'm sure all of us know class toppers. Most class toppers have always been class toppers and they seem to know the formula of how to ace an exam. And it's as though, you know, they, they just have to sit, flip a few pages and they come out with flying colors. In fact, many a times we hear their parents as well say that, oh, my child, he or she never studies at home but somehow is able to get very good marks in the exam. 
And sometimes we hear some of them say it with a bit of pride as well. That look how talented my child is. But I think if that's a study habit that a student has, then it might be one of the direct ways to destruction. And here I would like to quote the famous cricket commentator Harsha Bogle. In one of his talks he says, Talent can open the first door, maybe the second, but definitely not the last door. Because talent is something that you have, but if you don't have the skill sets that you need in terms of studying hard and working hard, then it is not going to open the last door. And here I would like to share an example of another student who I met a few weeks ago and he was part of one of our courses that, uh, that we ran about three years ago. And this fellow is doing his uh, preparation for IIT JE, the famous IIT JE exam and he's in grade 11 right now. So he seemed to be quite disturbed with the rank that he got in his class because he was always the school topper and he had seen nothing less than being a school topper. And usually for school toppers, there are a lot of things that come along the marks. They get to be the school leaders, they get to represent the school. So sometimes it is quite natural for school toppers to feel that I've done it all. I mean, that's all it takes. I've, I've, I've achieved it. But they achieved it because of sheer talent. But that is not the only thing that is going to help them in university or even for that matter when they get into these kind of coaching institutes. So coming back to this student's example, Usually in, in such coaching institutes, the students are segregated based on their marks. And he being one of the best students, he was in the top batch which had about 100 students and he was worried that his rank is in the 40s. And he's never used to coming 40s in a class. But just imagine, in a class of 100 bright students who have been class toppers in their respective schools, there will be somebody who is going to come rank 100, right? But that student has never experienced that position. They have never tasted that kind of thing and they see themselves as failures. They start doubting themselves. So what do we need to do or what did we miss in terms of, you know, getting this kind of a negative feeling in those students? We missed creating opportunities where these students get to see equally, if not more, talented students at a much younger age. Where they can understand that yes, I might be really good but there are a lot of other students who are at least as bright as me if not more. So these class toppers, if we don't nurture them quite early, if we don't give them the enough kind of challenge that they need, they might just settle to be class toppers and not, you know, achieve their highest potential. The next category that I want to talk about is the exceptionally brilliant. And those of you who would have seen this series, The Big Bang Theory, would know what is the kind of personality I am talking about. And these students come in different colors and shapes. And what I mean by that is, they have a different personality altogether. But in, in case of students like these who are deeply passionate about math or science, all that they can do is just talk and think about math and science. And I want to show you some images. So the first one that you see is a school assembly where all the students are standing there praying but this fellow is not able to take his head off from the math problem that was being discussed in the last evening. So they lose track of where they are and all that they need to do is math, math and only math. And the second picture is uh, again in an airport where they are going for a fun camp but there is nothing else that they have to discuss but math problems. And they got seating in a plane, unlike me and my friend who got adjacent seats, they got adjacent rows, but will that stop them from discussing math? No. So that's the kind of students that I'm talking about and usually somebody would feel that, oh, if somebody is so talented, then, you know, they have, they have got it, what's there to mentor them, they, what kind of help do they need? But unfortunately, these students need a lot more help than the regular students. And let me tell you why. I'll maybe take an example of the kind of students who come under this category just to give you a perspective. So there was one student who came to one of our camps when he was 10 and a half years old and <coughs> he, he understood something called as Riemann-Zeta function by reading an assignment. 
And if you don't know what is Riemann zeta function, it's something really profound, hard for even college students in the best of universities to understand and, you know, go ahead with it. And this fellow, when he was solving an assignment, he understood what that is. Nobody had to teach him. He's ten and a half. Back in school, he is learning about fraction addition. Students at the age of eight and nine, they are able to solve problems in trigonometry, quadratic equations, coordinate geometry, and they have to deal with very elementary level of math in school. So these students, they don't fit into the usual classes. And the teachers have always complaints about, or at least most teachers have complaints about these students. Not to blame them, they, they cannot cater to the kind of questions they have. Here you are talking about fractions and there somebody is asking about, hey, you know the, uh, you know, proof for Fermat's last theorem and the teacher is clueless, right? I mean, how to, how to answer that particular question. So to handle these students, there is a different set of, of a system that, that we need. So schools play a big role in terms of helping parents of these students, connecting them with psychologists or experts who work exclusively with, with these kind of students. And we definitely don't want to miss out on that chunk because they are the Ramanujans who can, who can contribute to the society in the years to come. So what is our role as, a, a, you know, society, as a parent, as a teacher? So first thing that we need to understand is there exists a big chunk of students who are quite bright. But when I say bright students, it's not a homogeneous group. They can be of different categories. So as a parent or as a teacher, I need to first understand under which category the student comes and accordingly make that kind of intervention. Is it a student who has, you know, being happy, just being a class topper, then I need to know what is the next thing that I need to do so that they don't just settle for being a class topper. Because these class toppers, when they get to tier one institutions and they see 99 other class toppers, that's not a very good state where they can, you know, they can be comfortable with. So depending on which category the students are, we need to help them and, you know, help them get them uh, the right potential. So uh, as parents, as teachers, as individuals, I think this is one thing that we all need to recognize that there, there exists a lot of responsibility on all of us in terms of nurturing and identifying these kind of students. And especially the last category, the Bazinga category that I was talking about because these students, they exhibit very different personality traits. And those traits sometimes may look very rude. They don't know how to behave with, you know, people the way we do. Some of them don't even understand jokes. Sarcasm is way above their head. So they don't understand idioms. And they may look quite indisciplined or, you know, a result of bad parenting, but that's, that's not how they are. That's not who they are. So as a society, we need to acknowledge, we need to accept that there exists a pool of such students and they need help. So what can we do so that they are not at a disadvantage of, you know, being nurtured and uh, groomed? So uh, I would like to quote one of my uh, favorite mathematicians, uh, Professor Ken Ono. Uh, he's a Japanese-American mathematician. So he says, genius cannot be taught they can only be nurtured. And geniuses cannot be manufactured. But as a society, we may lose out on geniuses if we don't nurture them at the right time. Thank you so much.